Welcome to another episode of the Gospel Lifeline Podcast. My name's Neil, here with Matthew Statler. Today we are continuing on through our series on uh, 10 questions to diagnose your spiritual health uh, by Donna Whitney. Um, so far we've gone through a bunch of them. We've kind of taken a little bit of break. Thank you guys for your patience. Holiday seasons are incredibly crazy for pastors. And so <laughs> that's where Matt and I have been. Uh, and so we're on the other side of that that craziness. Uh, engaging, Here we engaging come. in new crazy, but uh, which is why I'm really glad that the the chapter we're rolling into is the one that it is. And the question is this: This is the question Donna Whitney poses. Do you still grieve over sin? Man, what a what a fundamental question to diagnose your spiritual health, right? Yeah, you know, it seems like everywhere I go, um, people are trying to make you feel better about yourself. They're trying to, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, trying to say it's not a big deal. It's OK. Yeah, you, you, you're going to fail your resolutions. No big deal. You'll you know, you'll you'll grow from this. And it's all all kind of making you feel better. But then Whitney over here, he comes in and says, do you still grieve over sin? Yeah. And I don't know about you, but that kind of makes me feel kind of bad. Yeah. It, for good reasons, right? Because that acknowledges a reality we all deal with. We all deal with the reality of sin. And we deal with it in two different ways, essentially. One, as an unbeliever, you don't even you're not even cognizant of it unless it causes pain to others or yourself. That's when you're like, hey, maybe I did something that wasn't so great, you know, <laughs> but you but you don't know where to go to change, right? And you can't change yourself. For the believer, though, we we say, yeah, I mean, this is a present reality in my in my being that the Spirit of God who indwells me is in opposition to my sinful flesh, and so we're always dealing with this this issue, this issue of sin, this reality of sin. And I agree with you, Matt. Man, I think uh, everywhere we go in our society today. We're being essentially placated um, to feel better. You know, don't beat yourself up. Don't do, you know, I hear it it this way. You got to have grace for yourself, you know, and I'm like, no, I need God's grace because I'm a, I'm a daggum. I know what's in my heart. It's gross. You know what I mean? And there's only one who can change it. And that's what we'll talk about some today. And I think, you know, part of the problem is, not to be on a, a a podium for a minute. I'm going to rant for a second, Matt. <laughs> Bear with me, listeners. Um, uh, one of the issues is like, wh- wh- when did believers come to this point where we just started to placate each other in our sins? Um, I think it starts with uh, preaching. Um, the more preachers in the church don't talk about sin, the consequences of sin, and the judgment of God, the more you will drift away from your greatest need, who is Jesus Christ. And so we, we have to balance that, right? If all we do is talk about judgment coming and all this, all this fear, you know, fear type of language, right? We should tremble before the judgment of God, but also there's great hope, right? So we, we balance the two uh, in our, in our preaching. And I think it, I think it starts in the church because it's, it's that's the field where your discipleship happens. And uh, man, if you're in a place where they don't ever talk about sin, that should be a red flag. So let's say that out the get. That should be a red flag for you. Uh, maybe you should investigate a little bit further. Uh, but I as for on a personal level, right? This is also something we need to address in us as well. What are you going to say, Matt? I was going to say, you know, I think in some sense, um, and this can be overplayed, and this could be a whole uh, a podcast, but a law gospel distinction. Yeah. Uh, you know, do you go to a church that never preaches the law and only preaches free grace, free grace, free grace? Right. And it doesn't matter how you live. Doesn't matter. You know, there's no like, grace abounds to the chief of sinners. Yes and amen. But there's no law to say that you are a sinner. Uh, But at the same time, there are those churches that only preach law, 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 law. You must, you must, you must, you must. And then there's no, there's no gospel. Oh, but Christ has be unified to Christ and then you will. And, um, 
I think that distinction uh, maybe has bifurcated churches or uh, split churches to different right. groups, you know, and we see that, right? Some We see some it in the scriptures. Say, yeah, of course. And the yeah, church the law usually comes first. Church in Corinth would be all grace, you know, all grace, right? No, <laughs> they're just just going forward with whatever right. feels good and feels right. And Ball then you have heart. Galatia, uh, who's who's hammering down the law and not seeing Christ at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, what about you, Matt? Do you still grieve over sin? Yeah, and and I think. There are seasons when I grieve over sin more than others. I think it's easy to um, use painkillers, so to speak, um, by watching Netflix. Yeah, distractions. Or, yeah, distractions, fig leaves to kind of cover up um, my sinfulness. It's easy to point out other sins or say, look what I have done. Um, I think Jesus's parable about the uh, the two who come into the temple yeah, the Pharisee, you know, God, thanks for not making me like that unworthy tax creature collector, over there. Yeah. yeah, that tax collector. And then the tax collector is, you know, beating his chest, can't even lift up his eye and says, woe is me, a sinner. Um, yeah, mercy. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, so so yeah, do I still grieve over sin? Absolutely. Um, probably more so now than ever before. And a question I like to ask myself is, um, is this normal Christianity? Is this um, healthy uh, healthy and normal Christianity. And I think Whitney brings that up in this as well. Yeah. And he kind of talks about it. I'll use maybe a, a, a picture that might be helpful to describe what Whitney's discussing here. You know, when we first come to the, to the faith, we can see the, the cross, essentially, we can see our need for the first time. And it, sometimes it feels somewhat distant, right? But the more we grow in our faith, we approach the cross, we get closer to it. And, and over the course of our Christian lives, we see God more clearly. And when we see God more clearly, we understand his holiness more clearly, what yeah. he's called us to do more clearly. And what it does is it exposes how much more we need him, how much sin really exists in us still. And so, man, like I heard a, an older saint in my church say, man, I don't feel like I've been, you know, I've been walking with Jesus since 1980, whatever. And he was like, I don't feel you know, any, any more, you know, closer to being sanctified than today, you know, than, than, than back then. And, and what we talked through with him was like, well, the cross has become closer. The, the presence of God has been made more real in your life uh, and present in your life. Therefore you see more of what is awry in your heart. But the, the difference is, you know, and this isn't him, but I'm just going to say something hyperbolically. You know, the difference is like you're no longer doing cocaine to you know, like you were in the 80s <laughs> today. You're like, man, when I, when I spoke sharply to my wife, that was wicked right. and I need to repent of that. Like, so those things lessen over time as the cross becomes more in focus. Uh, in but the I, life I, I'm as convicted over a sinful thought now. Oh, yeah. As I as I was when I did some did something sinful. Yeah. Right. You know, so like I feel even worse now than when I was before. And I, and I think that's kind of a part of the dynamic is, you know, I see the sin for what it is more and more clearly. Um, one of my uh, one of the, my church members also brought up um, how he used to uh, be in LA and he used to do a lot of the HVAC systems and he would interact a lot with the maids in the area. And he said he was talking to one maid and sharing the gospel with her. And she's like, you know, I, I, be I became saved. And he said, Oh, great. How, well, how have you changed? You know, kind of asking some basic questions. And she's like, well, I haven't really changed. And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, there's nothing in your life that's changed from after coming to Christ. You know, you're not sinning anymore. She's like, well, I used to, to to sweep the dust underneath the carpet instead of putting it in the dust pan. And so if I saw a little dust, I just dust, I just, I just sweep it. And uh, he's, she's like, Shortcut. now I don't do that. It Now I don't do that anymore. And he's like, see, that's something like that's that radical thing. transformation, <laughs> especially in her life. Cause you know, all yeah. she did was just clean and work. And so, yeah, I, I think which is Matt really helpful for people who are natural rule followers. Right. That's right. A lot of net like folks 
And then it's like, when you say no, they say, okay, I won't do that, <laughs> you know? Or they're wired like Matt and I, where you say no, and I'm like, well, here's another way around that no, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm a natural rebel, <laughs> you we know? Buckle, yeah, we buckle down. Right. Um, so for, like, the rule follower out there, man, it, it may not look so distinctly different, you know, than maybe some of the other testimonies or whatever you hear in your life. Um, uh, but nonetheless, w- when the Holy spirit begins to indwell us, we begin, and we spend time in the word, you know, utilizing the tool that the spirit uses to shape us. Uh, we become more and more clear of our thought life of our affections where those are wicked of our, or desires, another way to say it. Um, the behaviors may not be as extreme, if you will, uh, but man, there's a whole lot of wickedness in your heart, uh, in your in your the way you think and believe, and the way you desire and feel. Um, and so, man, God's after the whole heart, and He's going to expose all of it. Uh, wow. So that's yeah. kind of the the uh, I guess the the foundational elements here. So. What do we do? We, uh, we we see ourselves as sinful. Praise God. We see God more holy. Praise God. Now, how do we respond in that reality? Yeah, well, one, I mean, you know, Whitney hits it here. He says we need to hate sin mm. um, and we need to cultivate a hate for sin. Um, and I think the more that we see Jesus, the more we're going to hate what he died or what caused his death, right? The sin. Us. Um, but I think, what's that? Go ahead. Us. <laughs> yeah, us. Um, and and, it's, and, it, and this is not like a Phariseeism where we're sitting there, you know, on our porch watching the neighbors and saying, ha, those wicked sinners, ah, oh, they're wicked, they're wicked, they're wicked. No, it's more like, man, I, I still have thoughts that could have led to that. Mm-hmm. Or I still have emotions that are out of control that I need to bring into the subservience of the, of the Lord. Right. I, I think, I think that's the the dynamic. And, you know, I think we begin to grieve it um, like the old Testament prophets when they wanted to put on sackcloth and ashes and um, throw ash on them and, um, and just cry out to God, save me from this body of death. Yeah. Uh, as we see Paul saying, so yeah. yeah, I think it should happen. We should begin to hate it. But it should also be continual, right, Neil? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a rinse, lather, repeat mechanism yeah. for the Christian life. <laughs> that's right. right. We brushed our teeth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. We every day you wake up, you put toothpaste on that toothbrush, and you brush your teeth. And if you're not, you should. Uh, so, and the same thing goes with repentance. Repentance is a normal aspect of the Christian life. We do it all the time. We reengage it, which is not to be confused with. Uh, quote unquote penance, uh, yeah. uh, or you know, you you like the term religious scrupulosity. If I said that correctly, uh, why don't right, you break right. that down? Yeah, before we get into that, I want to just define terms a little bit. You know, yeah, so sure. one um, in uh, Whitney's book, he talks about Jeremiah Burroughs. He says they think repentance or mourning for sin is but one act. That if once they have been troubled for sin, they need never be troubled anymore. Yeah. Uh, Sunday, I gave an illustration about, you know, if you have a, a cup of juice and you put it on the corner of the table, you knock it off, um, you're going to get your towels, you're going to clean it up. Um, but then when you go to fill up your juice, you don't put it right back on the edge of the table. You put it somewhere where it's not going to fall off again. And that's the put same it on thing the coaster. for us. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. we want to be careful to to turn, to to change, um, to make every effort not to fall back into that same sin. Uh, yeah. So repentance is, is like walking one direction and then turning around and walking the other. It's a it's a 180. It's no longer yeah. doing the same thing. So, yeah, we cry out in our sin. We ask for forgiveness. Uh, but then we actually change. So repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of action. It's a change of emotion. It's a change of heart, everything yeah. in us. And so uh, one of the issues, oh, go ahead, Neil. Yeah. And to just add an element, when you do change, you're going a new direction purposefully, right? right? So the new direction before, well, if before you were rebelling against God, 
and choosing sin and your flesh and or an idol or whatever that was you now changed your mind changed your course and now you're going the way of christ putting on his likeness and engaging in the acts of christ and so that's the full picture of a repentant person it's stopping the sin hating it confessing it seeking forgiveness that's the renewal of the mind and understanding what is the way of Christ and now engaging in the way of Christ. Yeah. You put off, you renew your mind and you put on. Right. Um, and it's, you know, it doesn't always look picture perfect, but that's the concept. Mm-hmm. But what I, yeah, what I found and, and I've had some interesting counseling cases like this where people become, um, and this may be a very small subset of Christians, but become religiously scrupulous. Yeah. Uh, and, and what that is, is when a, a about things of the faith, they become obsessively compelled uh, to want to 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 do some act in order to wash off the sin. Um, you know, it could be uh, the triple check indoors. Um, it could be um, every time you open your Bible, you have to do the cross. Um, it could be um, my. Oh, here's a good example: my grandma. Um, whenever she touched cards because she thought cards were evil, she would wash her hands, right? Um, and it, if that had been a normal thing for her, every time she had an evil thought, maybe she would do something with her head, right? Um, and and people become um, almost uh, a, a in bondage to this because there's yeah. dopamine hits, there's a habits, there's things that have been formed by doing these things. And there's another element, but Neil, go ahead. Yeah, they're they're almost trying to through an action ensure that promise is true for them. That's right. And yeah, so they're trying to earn earn their right. faith. Absolutely. And and you see this not just happen between them and God in this thing that you're describing, right? But you also see it on a horizontal level, a relational level, husbands who maybe have uh cheated on their wives in the past will uh do you know, do everything they can to serve them to earn their forgiveness or something like that. They'll, and this is the idea behind penance in this case, right? That I, yeah. I'm trying to engage in whatever these acts are so I can ensure that this is a reality in my life, whether that's done like you're describing in a vertical manner between you and God or on a hor- on a horizontal relational level with those that you've sinned against. Neil, uh, that's such a great example because it's like, you know, like so, someone cheats on their spouse, or their let's say their wife. The husband cheats on the wife. Um, he feels bad for what he's done. He feels sorry, um, and then as part of the repentance process in his mind, he thinks he's being repentant by doing um, more things for her. And the reality is, yes, he should be, right. but it should be born out of a love for her, a care for her, uh, putting her as more important than himself, a dying to self daily. And that should manifest the works, but that's not what's happening is no. he's trying to earn her love back yeah. rather than loving her. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the, the dynamic or the wheel or however you want to try to describe it, um, the motivation is is different, and then the of course the downstream effects. And in both uh, of those cases, they're they're almost like measures of manipulation, right? Of so course, you are, yeah. you're trying to manipulate God and what you desire from Him, even though you know He's given it to you. You're trying to ensure through these acts to get it. So it's a manipulative yeah. act, and the same thing goes with the people. You're trying to do, even though these are good things what we're describing serving your wife is a it's a biblical mandate right so um we we want to do those things born out of a a renewed and redeemed heart uh, but you've now turned you've distorted it into a manipulative act to ensure the reality of forgiveness or whatever else right or closeness because you feel insecure about your relational dynamic whatever that is and so man that's that's how tricky the heart is, y'all. <laughs> that's right. that's, yeah. that's how simple our hearts are. That's how easy it is to drift into a distorted, e- distorting even good and beautiful things. Um, and so that's why this is such a good uh, chapter because it talks about like uh, 
really by by being cognizant of your sinful nature, you are now almost like wise to the the deception of your own heart. You become more and more wise to how how you deceive yourself, even or or deceive even good things, distort even good things. But you know, so the second the second kind of aspect of this religious scrupul religious scrupulosity uh, is in um, becoming so introspective and such a, a navel gazer that you are continually wondering, did I commit the unpardonable sin? Did I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Um, you know, and, and I think Catholicism and all of its um, rituals and rites really feed into some of this for people because it's like, if I don't confess, um, then I, what if I die before I get my confession or I don't get last rites? And there's just this whole dynamic of like, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Um, or have I done something that God won't forgive? Yeah. Um, and that's what we see here. He's like, is there a right way and a wrong way to grieve in this book? And, um, and what, what Whitney points out is that, is that in second Corinthians seven, eight through 11, there's two kinds of sorrow for sin. Uh, one that is expressed as a godly grief and the other as a worldly grief. And I would posit that a lot of the grief that that people who become so rig religiously scrupulous about um, really is a worldly grief. It's kind of like the husband who cheats, who um, wants to, to, to do that for his wife. It's a worldly grief because he doesn't want to lose the benefits of being married. He doesn't want uh, separation, alimony, um, and, and just likes his convenient life. Whereas a godly grief um, is a, a kind of God's grace that leads to salvation um, and it produces biblical repentance. Um, you know, one quote from this that I liked was godly grief is much more than admitting your imperfections. I've never met anyone who considered themselves perfect, but among them were comparatively few who were often broken hearted because they knew themselves to be nonstop offenders against the law of God. Mm. And uh, Neil, you had a, a, a really good uh, grab from this as well. Yeah, it, essentially, godly grief is God word grief. So yeah. you think also about the the trajectory that you you come on when you when you are undergoing sorrow from sin. Um, the trajectory for you when you recognize your sin and it's caused pain and there are sin consequences you're enduring. There's one or two responses. One, like you said, is navel gazing. It's like you become the center of the universe, and all you think about is yourself in that moment. This is awful. I hate this. I want to change so that I don't have to go through this anymore, so on and so forth. Although some of those things may be true, your soul, your soul focus is you. A God word grief says that sets the trajectory of my eyes are up on what I actually need. And what I need, you know, is God's uh, forgiving grace and ultimately his transforming grace. And so it's him who reshapes us, who molds us, right? And we, and we see this in the Bible in so many places. You know, I think one of the most sticky examples is in Genesis 3, right? In Genesis 3, you have the man and the woman, they rebel against God, they eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, uh, in order to become like God, uh, with that with that as the motive, and uh, they recognize immediately that they are naked and they and they have shame, and so what do they do? Well, they say, "I have this problem of shame and nakedness." They navel gaze literally, and <laughs> then they and then they go and sew fig leaves for themselves to try and cover their sin and shame. A Godward grief says, I can't cover my guilt and shame, shame, yeah. but God can. So instead of hiding from him, I will draw near to him. And we see in Genesis three, God killing the first animal and clothing the man and woman covering um, their, their sin, their guilt and shame in that act that, that he, he provides the, the actual working solution, long-term solution. It's not us. And so that's what that's what that's the dynamic that happens very quickly when we sin. We'll either do one or two things. We'll 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 recognize the 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 consequence of our sin and the reality of our sin. It'll we will grow sorrowful over it 
and and a worldly sorrow will go what solutions can i produce a godly sorrow it will say i i can give nothing to fix this i need i need to be solely dependent upon god and i need to come to him confessing my sin asking for forgiveness asking him to transform me at that yeah. point and uh, we recognize of course that it's all by grace through yeah. faith and um that the this this sinful body of death that we we have our our sinfulness is um covered by him and yeah so the more we can gaze on him and, and be conformed to him the less that we're going to be have these easily entangling sins yeah. uh, and you know there should be a continual growth there so uh, the final question yeah in, i was going to ask that so so what do we do if you're listening you're like man i'm not too much of a griever of my sin <laughs> what, what do i do how do i maybe you desire to get there what are some things some practical measures that you can take um neil to, did you ever do any kind of like karate or anything like that oh yeah and uh while you're doing karate you kind of like have sparring but you're like you pull your punches right yeah sure uh, whitney you're not trying to do take that. someone's head off <laughs> yeah yeah you know where you tap each other and you and you know a touch is, a, is equal to a hit right uh, but whitney's not doing that here he goes in full off he says if you're not grieving over your sin you need to make sure you understand the gospel of the yeah. new testament uh, first and foremost quotes, <laughs> yeah he quotes from owen he says i do not understand how a man can be a true believer in whom sin is not the greatest burden sorrow and trouble and so he said if you're not sure that that this is you He's like, first, make sure you are in Christ, that, that you understand the life, death, and resurrection, the uh, the atoning sacrifice that Christ gave. And uh, so that's the first thing. Right? Well, and um, I liked how he he formed it, man. He he says, hey, write it out. Write out what right. you believe the gospel to be. And I would add, man, take that gospel to your pastor and, um, man, work through that. This is what I currently think the gospel is. Am I off? Is this what the Bible teaches? Can you help me to make sure that I truly grasp this, this work? Yeah, of he says, write it like a letter or an email to someone. And I would say, write it like a letter to yourself. Yeah. Matt, dear Matt, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I would write it out because it kind of goes down to the uh, last point he makes about preach the gospel to yourself every day. You know, so if you've written a letter to yourself about what the gospel is, you can use that to remind yourself of the gospel. Yeah. Um, that's why I really like that. The Orthodox catechism, you know, what is my only hope in life and death that I'm not my own and belong body and soul to my, my creator. Right. And just reading that, remembering that. Um, anyways, the second thing he says is ask God to show you the reality of your sin. Yeah. Search, search me. Oh God. And see if there's any wayward way within me. Yeah. And and I would argue that's probably the fastest prayer you can pray. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you ask God to reveal the sinfulness of your heart. He, man, he will. Yeah. Uh, and glory to him for it, because that will also expose, as we've already talked about, what our need is and what the work of Christ actually is, which is in the gospel. And then the next thing he says, hey, pray slowly through Psalm 51, making it your own heart-filled prayer. Why why do you think he recommends Psalm 51? Why why would you argue in affirmation of this technique? I, I think it's a, a psalm. Well, it's a psalm that David wrote, and David wrote it when he became truly heavily convicted for what he had done. Uh and and I think just the uh, the language of it, the action of it, you know, you name it, ha is providing for you a pattern of lament for your own sin. Um, yeah, an example. One, and I think grief people over don't know sin. how to pray. What's that? I said it provides an example of grief over sin. And also, yeah. like you said, I mean, a, lot of, a lot of us don't know actually what it looks like to pray when we find ourselves in rebellion against God. And I would add one more thing uh, to what you said about why this would be a helpful technique or exercise right and that's because the focus of that psalm is solely god mm -hmm. and so you see an example of godly sorrow expressed in a prayer of psalm 51 from king david 
um, after the worst season of rebellion in his life at that point. Um, so it helps us to understand where we need to go, who the focus is, get our eyes off of ourselves, and put them on our greatest need. And Neil, it, it engages the emotions. You know, that's another thing about the Psalms that a lot of the, the letters don't do as much, but it engages your emotions. And, you know, just like you could read um, a really heartfelt story and not really feel impacted, but a well done video depiction of it can really pull you, you know, add music or whatever. Yeah. And, and I, and I think, you know, there's something about the Psalms that pull in your affections <laughs> and part of the sorrowing for sin is an affection um, recognizing intellectually what you've done, but also the affections being brought into that. And that's what God's done in music. I mean, think about it when you watch a movie, every movie has a score under it, right? A musical score. You know, you, re you lit, you know, if you've ever watched, uh, well, it was say interstellar as an example, right? Uh, it's one of my favorite movies, but one of the reasons it's, it's my favorite movie is because of the, the score that Hans, Hans Zimmer did for the movie. And it provokes emotions in the right way. The Psalms are songs. Don't get it mistaken. And the Lord is, you can think of it like scores. <laughs> like it's meant to invoke uh, emotion and and victory and hope and despair and all of these things that that need to drive our hearts towards our God. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and the part of that will then lead into meditating on the fact that it was your sin that nailed the holy sinless one uh, from heaven to the cross. You know, are you never sorrowful for causing the death of Jesus? Uh, think of what your sin cost the most pure, loving, and gracious one who ever lived. Hmm. Um, and just really begin to meditate on your particular sin. Yeah. Well, that's all we have on the question of do you grieve your sin? Do you continue to grieve your sin? Um, next time we get together, we'll be talking about, are you becoming a quicker forgiver, uh, which is mm. a great place to go to after we just talk about sin. What about right. when people sin against us? <laughs> How do we respond? Right. Uh, so looking forward to that. Um, hey, listeners, we appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. Uh, we just want to encourage you today. Uh, if you, if you start asking that hard question about grief of sin, and what it exposes is quite a lot of sin. Do not despair. Um, despair your sin, but hope in Christ, and he will redeem you and restore you uh, because that's his faithful love for his children. Uh, so, guys, thanks for listening to the Gospel Lifeline. Until next time, Neil and Matt, we out.